little bit of work towards natural language inference, um, a word that I've purposefully left out of the title. Um, well, okay, so paraphrases are differing textual expressions with the same meaning. So you can think of simple synonyms like cup and mug. You can think of uh, phrasal paraphrases like the king's speech and his majesty's address. And then you can think of uh, templates that have gaps or non-terminals. Um, so something like x1 talks to x2, which can be paraphrased as converses with x2. And um, if you refine those a little bit by adding syntactic labels, you get to what we call syntactic paraphrases, and that's what we're be, uh, going to be working with. Now, um, actually note that these subsume um, all of those types. So in fact, we can have those x label paraphrases that we try to avoid that, and we most definitely will have lexical and phrasal paraphrases as well in um, what we extract. Now, uh, paraphrases are quite useful, I will claim. Um, they've been successfully applied to improve coverage and uh, generally outcomes in a variety of NLP tasks, uh, including information extraction, question answering, um, sentence compression, language simplification, uh, natural language generation, and so on. Um, and the particular kind of paraphrasing that I'll be talking about is, uh, well, data-driven for one, and secondly, focused on particular types of data that we actually extract paraphrases from. So paraphrases have been extracted from malingual parallel corpora, which is uh, reasonably evident. We have two English sentences that you know mean the same thing, and you can align them. Uh, but these corpora are pretty small and rare, so uh, you can't get very far with that. There's more lingual comparable corpora where you have, say, news articles on the same event, and typically what people do is they end up extracting more lingual parallel data from that and then extracting paraphrases. Uh, we try to focus on two data sources that are way less sparse, namely bilingual parallel data. Uh, so data sets that are used in translation typically. Say you have a sentence line corpus uh, of English and French. Um, and then we use plain bilingual English text to uh, kind of complement that a little bit. So um, as I said, we use bilingual parallel corpora. Uh, the nice thing about those is twofold. One, um, they're available in large quantities and quite easily. And secondly, the signal between uh, when having two sentences that are aligned is fairly strong. You will basically, especially since it's translations, know that um, everything has a correspondence, and so this is something that you can rely on further down the, the whole uh, processing pipeline. Um, the way we extract paraphrases from this data is using the uh, pivoting approach. So the notion is basically, if you have a phrase like plans in the long term in English, and you know that it translates to the German langfristige Pläne, um, and then you see the German somewhere else in your data, and it translates to long-term plans, uh, then you make the assumption that uh, these two, you can basically hop over the German and connect the two English phrases and uh, say they are paraphrases of one another. Um, and that works fairly well. So this gives you phrasal paraphrases. Now, uh, what we do is we step, we try to step this up to um, uh, syntactic paraphrases, and uh, namely what we do is we build a synchronous context-free grammar with these. Um, I'm going to show a bit of a sketch that's kind of a stepwise progression towards that. So one of the first things that uh, were an improvement upon phrasal paraphrase extraction was actually done by Chris, and that's simply um, labeling these uh, phrases with uh, the syntactic constituents that you see dominating them in the data. You have you parse your input, and uh, what you do is simply you restrict the pivoting to only phrases that actually match with their, uh, the, where the constituents match. Um, so what that does is mostly it weeds out a lot of bad paraphrases. Now, what we do is a second step, um, which is fairly intuitive. What basically the idea is, if you label the whole phrase, you can also label subphrases, right? Um, so in this case, we label the number and the, uh, the noun. And what you then do is you generalize away from the actual text representation. So it's not 12 anymore that you care about, but you care about the label CD. And in the same uh, way, you don't care about the participants or the runners anymore. You care about the fact that it's an, uh, a plural noun. And so you get this sort of rule. And the nice thing about that is now that you've stopped caring about the actual uh, instantiations and you only look at the uh, textual representation, what you can do is you can expand that 
to completely different textual inst inst instantiations. Um, so in this case, uh, and generally, you just get broader coverage. So this, this should help basically to uh, find rules that generalize well while still being uh, labeled with linguistic constraints that allow you to kind of stay well formed as you apply them. Uh, and yet you get the opportunity to collect uh, data, basic statistics over a wider variety of um, occurrences. So the goal in doing that, um, as I kind of noted, I think, is generally to prefer generalization or memorization. And we try to get these general patterns and we try to stay um, uh, well formed by using linguistic information. So we can apply these, uh, these paraphrases once extracted to uh, virtually any sentence to sentence text generation task. Um, so here we, here's some results from us applying them to sentence compression. What you see is uh, human scores on sentence compression. So you get an input sentence and you try to make it shorter while preserving the meaning. Uh, and these are uh, people on Mechanical Turk that have judged the outputs compared to the inputs and said, um, how good is the meaning preservation? That's uh, green. And how grammatical is the output? And we're comparing against the reference compressions. We're comparing against a random deletion baseline that just kind of takes out words um, at random and accordingly on the far right does pretty poorly. And we're comparing about against an actual uh, deletion-based state-of-the-art system that uses integer linear programming to kind of find an optimal number and uh, set of deletions. And it turns out we do uh, all right. So we do less well in terms of grammaticality, simply because deleting full constituents typically is much easier than rewriting the whole sentence, even if you have linguistic uh, syntactic labels. However, we do better in terms of meaning retention, which is nice and also to be expected because, again, we're using paraphrases. We're not actually actively deleting things. We're trying to replace them with just shorter versions of themselves. Um, so that's neat. Uh, now, what we do next is... Oh, yes. So this is for a particular level of compression? This is, yes, this is all at the same level of compression, I think about 75%. So you go uh, one quarter shorter. Just and, one quarter. I was going to say, without deleting constituents, you can't make it that much shorter. Yes. So that's something we've, we've seen. We have, um, we've run other experiments where we have actually explicitly added deletion rules and S so that allow you to delete full adjectives or adverbs. Um, and those start helping as you go down to compressions of about 50%. Right, so, so far, if, if you've noted, we've basically used uh, machinery and kind of approaches that are very similar to translation still. So um, everything is, is basically what we do is we just build an English to English synchronous context to grammar and we apply it. And we also use statistics that are derived in uh, translation manners. So this is all collected over the bytext. Um, and now what we're going to do is to improve the system, we're going to add an orthogonal signal derived from a lingual text. Um, and the advantage of using that sort of data is that it's virtually unlimited. You can just go on the internet and start downloading everything. And um, if you have enough uh, tools to process it, you can easily uh, annotate it with rich contextual features that might get lost on other sources like, for instance, bilingual data. Um, the notion that we're going to use is distributional similarity. So the idea here is if you have a potential paraphrase pair like, say, cup and mug, what you're going to try to compare them by is the uh, environments that you see them occur in, in the data. So for instance, cup will occur with um, words that are, well, cup-like. So there is drinking cup words like drink and coffee and hot chocolate and so on. And there is other cup-related words like soccer world or... Um, that sort of thing. And similarly for mug, you find words that are, are related to the drinking sense and you find words that are um, related to other senses like uh, mugshot or when you get mugged and you lose your wallet, that sort of thing. So uh, what I've color coded here is that the green words basically match between the two envir example environments that you see. And if you find that these matches are strong enough, basically you will extract that as a paraphrase pair. Right. This is the general notion. Um, and you compare that by basically aggregating these contexts over a large amount of data, um, storing them in a compact format, and uh, essentially computing the similarity, a similarity value between the two context representations. Now, the way we've done this for our syntactic paraphrase rules is a little bit different because 
uh, for the sake of not having to necessarily parse and process the entire molingual text data that we, we're seeing, we are actually um, not scoring the context of the full syntactic rule. Instead, we're decomposing the full syntactic rule into short phrasal chunks. And those are much easier to score because you don't have to uh, now know that it has occurred to the left of an NP and that sort of thing. And the way we do this is that we find an alignment within the paraphrase rule. We extract phrases, again, similarly to as one does in translation. And then we just uh, compute the similarity of each of these phrases and simply average over them. So this gives us an estimate and approximation of the similarity of this particular rule. Now, you can obviously do that in a more refined fashion, namely actually find this rule occurring in corpus. Um, and this is something that we'll get to, but this is more robust, and especially in light of the, some of the data that we're going to use, which I'm going to mention later. Um, we consider two types of contexts in, in our work. Uh, one is an Angram context, which is actually based on the fact that we're using the Google Angrams as a compact corpus representation. Um, the Google Angrams only have Angrams. Um, and so basically all we can do is we can see this particular phrase that we're looking at, in this case the long term, and we see words that occur to the left and right of it and counts for these words. And this is all we store basically in our context representation. Um, so that's, this is what we will work into the contextual signature of the long term based on the engram corpus. Uh, we also work with a uh, much more uh, kind of refined parsed, processed corpus, the annotated gigaword. And on that one, we actually have a lot of um, richer features. So here we see the long term in the context of an actual sentence. We have a parse for that sentence. We have public speech tags. Uh, we have dependencies. And essentially, we extract all of that. And we throw that into a much richer context representation. Now, the difference is that uh, the parsed corpus is typically much smaller than the combined data that the Google engrams represent. Uh, so you will simply get less of uh, coverage. However, you will get richer um, context. Uh, and so adding this information simply as an additional feature, the similarity uh, to our paraphrase rules, and again, plugging that into the compression tasks, actually yields significant improvements. So adding the engram information, which is a high coverage but very simplistic model, um, gives a significant, a significant jump over the plain paraphrases. And this particular experiment, adding the, syntax, uh, the syntactic, the rich context features, improves this even more. <clears throat> uh, so one thing to be noted here is that in this experiment, the um, coverage of the syntactic model is vastly smaller, actually. So we're looking at 200 uh, contiguous phrases that we have contexts for uh, from the Google Engram corpus versus, I believe, 15 million only from uh, extracted from the annotated gigaword. Here. Yes? Uh, what are the error bugs there? Like, how many typos are evaluated in um, I don't have a, well, you can assume that this is actually somewhat fluctuating. So um, the differences between the, both the syntax and the engram and the paraphrases are significant. Um, the differences, the improvements over ILP and meaning are significant, uh, but the whole, the, all this course came from Mechanical Turk and we have not done a whole lot of uh, sophisticated um, reliability analysis on the Turkers yet. So this is something that, basically this is an old experiment from last year uh, that just illustrates the application of the paraphrases. Um, this is something to be redone and actually kind of uh, souped up a little bit in uh, future efforts. All right, so um, now what we've done now is this was basically explaining the, the whole paraphrase extraction process. Now uh, what we're going to do is we're going to scale it up to uh, a very large data set. Um, we have essentially taken any bytex that we could uh, get our grubby hands on. So this data set includes the Europol data for all 19 languages, uh, French, English, Greek, word, uh, smaller news, com news commentary data, uh, the United Nations bytexts and a bunch of others, other sets. Um, it totals over 100 million sentence pairs in English and some foreign language. This uh, gives you about 2 billion English words, and the total number of actual foreign languages included in this composite bytext are 22. So this is quite diverse and large. Uh, the monolingual data that we're going to use for this large-scale extraction uh, is going to be the one that I mentioned already. Uh, so the Google Angrams, which is, I think, the largest collection that we 
can really use, however, in a compacted format, and the, uh, the full set of the annotated GigaWord, which is a, uh, a parsed and processed version of GigaWord that Courtney and uh, Matt and Ben put together last year. Um, all right, and so we've taken all this data and we've applied our extraction method to that. So we've extracted uh, syntactic paraphrases via pivoting and we've scored them using monolingual distributional similarity. And we've done that for English, which yields, uh, in terms of lexical paraphrases, about almost 8 million, and then accordingly more in terms of uh, phrasal paraphrases and syntactic ones. Uh, so these are actual paraphrases where the other phrase is different. We also retain identity paraphrases where basically you paraphrase cup as cup. The interesting part about doing that is that you still retain statistics for this particular paraphrase. So you get some sort of estimate of how dangerous or how, how good is it to retain uh, this particular phrase as itself versus paraphrasing it. Uh, this is something that's useful when you do actual text-to-text -text generation. Uh, because you don't necessarily want to paraphrase everything simply. Uh, um, okay, and so the total number of English paraphrases, including those identity paraphrases, goes up to about 225 million. Uh, we've done the same thing for Spanish, because if you've noticed, none of this stuff was actually language dependent at all. The only thing that you want is to have parses. In this case, we basically took our, the, span, the portions of this composite bytext uh, that I mentioned before, that had Spanish as the foreign language, and we projected the English parses over to the Spanish using word alignments. And so we get this uh, probably slightly noisier set of Spanish paraphrases from that, which is also really large, actually, even though it's derived from a, a portion of the text, uh, simply based on the fact that Spanish has way more inflections than, uh, than English. And um, yeah, so this exists too. And these two sets we release, um, so there was a short paper in NACL this year where we uh, basically describe how we built the data set and announce it. Um, I have pre-release versions lying around if somebody needs them and uh, they'll be out in time for NACL, the full set. So this is all nice, this is a lot of stuff, but um, what we haven't really talked about it is, uh, is it any good? Um, and we did a, a little experiment where we tried to, we took PropBank, which is uh, one of the resources that kind of is exemplary for a tasks that we think people might be using paraphrases for. So if you care about uh, things like semantic parsing, uh, PropBank is a good resource to use. Um, and the way PropBank is set up is it takes uh, the, the pantry bank and it annotates each sentence with um, Predicate, predicate relations, like in this case, to expect the verb, and their arguments. So in this case, the, uh, uh, the few economists that do expect something and the data that shows something, which is what they expect. Um, so we take these annotations, and out of these annotations, we take the predicates, so the verbs. And we take a look at uh, PPDB, and we try to establish how much of these, how many of these verbs do we actually cover? Um, how does that coverage change as we prune away bad paraphrases, or what we consider low scoring paraphrases, and how good are these paraphrases at any point in time that we retain uh, when faced with some human judgment. And so here's a graph that uh, illustrates that. So what you see on the x-axis is a pruning threshold. This doesn't really mean a whole lot. It basically is a arbitrarily chosen combination of some probability features. And going from left to right, we, have, we start out with the full set of uh, paraphrases that we've extracted, and we start pruning away low-scoring ones. Right. Um, the bottom graph shows you the progression of the average human judgment of the paraphrases that we retain. So it starts out, uh, it, it's judged on a scale from one to five, one being awful or not at all related, and five being a perfect paraphrase. Um, and it's, it starts out at um, something like 2.8, which actually isn't too bad, considering the, the size that we're looking at. Um, and then goes up steadily. So this is, this is nice, this is encouraging. We have not optimized this curve in any way, so um, it is uh, likely that if we were to try to actually select the weights such that we would give more weight to uh, valuable features and less to less valuable ones, we would get an even better result in terms of progression. Um, on the top graph, what you see is the coverage. That's the red and blue curves. The red one is the coverage by 
token. So basically any occurrence in the body of prop bank, any predicate that occurs somewhere in there, do we have a paraphrase for it? Uh, the, and the type, the blue curve, is basically if you collapse all these uh, different occurrences by actual verb forms, so said, for instance, appears um, any number of times in that corpus, uh, basically the question now is out of all the different types that we have seen, how many, uh, what proportion of those do you actually cover? And so what it turns out that at our peak we cover about 52% of all verb types in PropBank and that amounts to, I think, almost 97% of all token occurrences, uh, which is not too bad. Um, what you also see is a green curve that drops steadily and what that signifies is it aligns to the right y-axis. What that signifies is the number of paraphrases that we have for each type covered. So basically at any point of this graph, what you, what you can do is you can say, okay, uh, so say a judgment of four is what I consider good and usable for my application. So it goes over here, um, so you hit this, and then you go up, and what you see is at only retaining paraphrases that have an average score of four or better, we cover about 50% of all types in PropBank and still about, well, 95, 92, maybe percent of all token occurrences. And looking at the green curve, we have about uh, 20, 30 paraphrases for each of those types that we cover on average. So that's not too bad. It's not a deep uh, qualitative or quantitative analysis, but this gives you a notion that uh, both the, uh, the body of paraphrases is fairly solid, it has good coverage, and um, the scores, the features that we compute for the paraphrases are uh, carry valuable information. You, did, you tried to, like this average that you're showing us, that's of course average over all sentences, right? Uh, mm. Say, I don't know how many sentences you had on which this average is an average. Is it like a thousand? thousand? This is uh, purely, oh, uh, we judged about, so we didn't judge sentences, we judged single expressions, single paraphrase rules. Oh, I see. You're we judged about 1,200 of those, I think. Okay. I see. I thought you were still, because the previous month in compression, you were judging whole sentences. Yes, yes, that was sentence level. This is basically looking at PPDB and whether we have, if you give us a verb that occurred in PropBank, right. do we have a rule for it? That's the, that's the question that this graph is asking. Okay. I see, so in other words, if something is not covered, it's not in your average. Um, I'm to, yes, yes, it, it can't be because we don't have a rule for it, so we wouldn't be judging it. So, so in other words, the, the number of things over which the average is computed is changing along the x-axis. Yes. Yes, because you throw away low scoring ones. So the, uh, the number of things, this is why the curve gets all wobbly at the end. Right. Because there you only actually are looking at you know, a handful of remaining paraphrases that score really high, of which we have randomly sampled even less and judged them. Okay. So, um, the machine that we used to, to do all this is Arun. Uh, so it's the Joshua Decoder, which is originally an MT system, and we're slowly pushing it towards being more uh, paraphrasy. It includes Thrax, which is a, a grammar extractor that's based on Hadoop. And we're using Gerbo, which is a toolkit that Ben developed to uh, compactly represent all these vast monolingual <coughs> uh, contexts. So. Um, as we basically started out scaling paraphrasing up to the size that we, uh, we now have achieved with PPDB, uh, none of this, well, except for Jabua, which is laid out for large data, but neither Joshua nor Thrax were really capable of handling um, this amount of data or basically grammars this large. So uh, essentially we had to rewrite Thrax, the grammar extractor completely. Um, and here's a quick breakdown of uh, basically the result of that. So. Uh, the rewrite included um, substituting a completely new extraction core, so basically the, the black box that takes a sentence pair and gives you rules, translation rules in this case, and then um, completely changing up the uh, internal representation that Thrax uses to uh, you know, aggregate rules, store them, and all that in the Hadoop framework. So um, the net result of it is that um, 
we use quite reliably about 75% less uh, space on disk, which actually has uh, made us go from we can't extract grammars from this corpus at all to, hey, this takes about an hour. Uh, so that's nice. And we, uh, we are fast up to about the same amount of faster, so we take about 25% of the time as previously on large corpora. Uh, but this changes, of course, as the core. Two of these corpora are quite small, and so the time gains aren't as, as valuable. Yet still, the, um, the savings in disk uh, space um, persist. And on top of that, I'm not showing any blue scores here, but actually we also see quite consistent blue improvements because um, there were bugs in both rule extraction and some feature computation that we fixed along the way. Um, all right, so the nice thing about Thrax is that it runs basically out of the box in, on Amazon. So in fact, the, the bytex of PPDB is so large that we could not run it on the Hadoop cluster that we have here locally at the COE. Uh, we were producing too many rules for the disks to handle in terms of read-write operations, so everything just got stuck and horribly slow. But on the upside, once you learn how to properly use Amazon, you can get away for very, very cheap. So the Spanish portion of, of PPDB, which uses less data but extracts almost the same amount of paraphrases, uh, took about eight hours to extract, uh, cost about 100 bucks, and used 100 machines, four cores each, and so on. So this is uh, really nice, actually. So if you have large-scale computing jobs, um, certain ways to use Amazon is, are um, viable. This one. Uh, the English portion of PPDB I'm not showing here because it's a little bit more embarrassing simply. If you don't use spot instances, which are the cheap machines that you basically name your own price and that you can lose as soon as the market price goes over that, um, are maybe one order of magnitude more expensive than that. And so, in fact, extracting the English portion costs us about $1,000, which still, if you talk about a resource this large and this potentially useful for essentially all of NLP, is fairly cheap. So uh, that's neat. All right, uh, the other thing is now that we have this, this uh, paraphrase database, this way, well, English to English translation grammar, if you will, um, what happens if we try to apply it to text-to-text -text generation tasks? So if we, basically what I did is I went back to the compression task that we had and I um, tried to, let's run one compression with the PPDB data. Uh, it turns out if you, so what you do typically if you have a large grammar and you have a finite set of sentences that you know you're going to compress. So you're going to throw out all the grammar rules that you know will not, never apply. Uh, you do that, what you end up with is about still half of the paraphrase database, which is uh, horrid. So you, you, you're, sitting, you're looking at 118 million rules that you need to load into memory and then decode with. Uh, trying to do that with the standard implementation of uh, memory, uh, well, I'm sorry, standard implementation of grammar storage in Joshua would take about, well, almost 200 gigabytes of memory which I think some of our machines have, but you can't actually really access the full amount. Either way, I didn't actually manage to load that. I extrapolated the number from having loaded about 86 million, and then it died. Um, and this took hours, so that's not great. What we did instead, uh, so this is joint work with Matt Post, uh, we devised a uh, packed grammar representation that relies on packed tries. So either way, you will store your grammar in a try data structure, which means that you look it up by, say, the source side, which is a, a string uh, made of several words. And basically, you just send a tree going down word by word. Uh, and at every node in that tree, you know what uh, expression you've basically expended so far. And you find all the rules that apply when you try to paraphrase that particular expression. Uh, now, the most naive way, and this is how Joshua previously implemented this, is just by having a large, large tree and where every node is a huge hash table. This is not very economical in memory, as you've just seen on the previous slide. Um, but luckily, you can represent tries in a very compact way by just smashing everything into one array and kind of just jumping from position to position with a format that you've previously kind of devised that tells you exactly where can you search for the next uh, kind of node and where can you find all the rules that apply to this node all this sort of thing. I'm not going to go into detail of this, uh, of, of this exact format, 
But uh, the bottom line is it takes about 3% of the unpacked space in memory. And it loads in a little over two minutes. The decoding is slightly slower because you have to convert this whole implicit representation into the explicit rule object that we're still using in, in the decoder. But um, considering that it enables you to do things that you couldn't do before in the first place, is, that is uh, an acceptable price to pay. Um, yeah, so, so far I've uh, kind of outlined the, uh, the scaling up of paraphrase extraction to very large corpora of uh, multiple types and multiple languages. Um, I've given you an overview over the improvements that we've made to the infrastructure to make that possible, and we have released, or we are about to release this resource as um, a, a freely usable tidbit for um, anybody that's interested in NLP. And it's already being uh, asked after and used somewhat wildly. Well, more than five. Um, so the next step in, in this whole line of work is to try to refine the paraphrases a little bit and try to open up um, new avenues of application. And what I mean by that is that um, right now we have a collection of rules where we say that this expression is exactly the same thing as this other expression with some probability. So that's where you kind of put your, your doubt about the quality of that, that rule. But uh, there is no further statement. You, you, all you kind of care about, all you um, say is this is equivalent in meaning. Uh, that is not true. We've done some sampling of, of the database. Uh, we've take, taken a look at some rules. And if you apply slightly stricter <laughs> standards, we actually look at the two expressions and you, you care about the, the meaning and the context that they're used in, you'll find that they are often related, they're often good, but uh, they're almost never actually identical. And so this is something that we want to work on. We want to take this paraphrase collection and classify the rules into not just uh, this is equivalent, but classes like um, this expression subsumes the other expression, it's a forward entailment, or the other way around, backward entailment. Maybe we have some er erroneous extractions and there is negations in the rules, this is also something we want to catch. So that sort of thing. Well, doing this uh, would enable us to tackle things like natural language inference or recognizing textual entailment, which is basically the difference between having a textual rewrite task like this compression example and an entailment task where you have two sentences that talk about the same thing, or that you actually don't know if they talk about the same thing, but um, you want to know, does the first sentence entail the second one? Uh, so in this case, 12 illustrations insulting the prophet caused unrest. That's a pretty brief statement. And um, the question is, is that, is that expression entailed by riots in Denmark were sparked by 12 of the editorial cartoons that were offensive to Muhammad. And what I've drawn in here is a synchronous parse, which is a simplification of the actual problem because almost never will you really find a nice synchronous parse between sentences like that. But leaving that aside, um, you can align these sentences using the synchronous parse and you can apply a, a variety of different kind of types of rules to get to the conclusion that indeed the bottom sentence does entail the top one. So some of these rules are still the straight up paraphrase rules that we've uh, <coughs> seen before. So something like Muhammad is usable equivalently to the prophet and 12 and the word 12. But now you can, uh, you would like to have one directional entailment rules. So something that encompasses deletions of say adjectives like editorial to nothing or deletions of complete uh, prepositional phrases like in Denmark, going to nothing. And then you can have entailment relations like cartoons, which are a type of illustration that you want to know about that. Or riots, which is a kind of unrest that you may see somewhere. Um, and so you can apply these rules to, to these sentences. And then what you will need to do is you will need um, another type of rule, which basically is the now more complicated actual kind of syntactic paraphrase rule that has um, child subtrees that it, uh, that it takes as argument. And what this, this kind of rule need, will, be, will need to do is it has an inherent uh, relation. So in this case, for instance, you know that some number of something actually subsumes you saying that uh, this number of the something. 
So basically, one is more precise than the other. Um, at the same time, you want to know what happens if I actually plug in uh, subtrees into this rule. And in this case, for instance, you, you plug in the, um, so it's highlighted in green, this is what we're applying right now. Uh, you plug in the previously seen rules where 12 is equivalent to 12. And editorial cartoons are actually a type of illustration, so a more general statement. Uh, I'm sorry, illustration is a more general statement. And so if you, if you plug in those two subtrees into this rule, what is the ensuing um, entailment relation that you can propagate up the tree? Uh, well, so basically, this is the type of uh, mechanism that we will need to design to be able to tackle this sort of task. And this is still leaving out a lot of uh, the problems with not actually fully being able to align the sentences and um, having multiple sentences that you try to process for one entailment relation, that sort of thing. So um, summing up, basically, the challenge now is to expand this par the, the paraphrasing uh, idea to tackle more diverse tasks like uh, entailment recognition um, and the hope that we have is that this because of the the volume of paraphrases that we have the coverage and the the amount of data that we process will actually improve on previous systems that have tackled those tasks in more specific more kind of restrained ways and maybe take it closer to our real world applicability and um, well a nice thing just in general uh, this feeds very well into a currently ongoing DARPA research effort that uh, basically ties in um, everybody in NLP that works on anything that's related to recognition or processing of entailment. And that is it. Thank you. So um, there's two things that we've thought about so far. One is when we do the classification of paraphrase rules, we want to try to avoid making a hard judgment. So basically what you will have is an annotation with a distribution over various possible entailment relations for this one rule. And so essentially what this will give you is a soft weeding out of possible relations. Uh, the other thing is, um, Conceptually, this is slightly different, but builds on uh, Bill McCartney's natural logic system, NatLog. And um, what he did was basically, he didn't do synchronous parsing, but he did alignments and basically represented the relationship between two sentences as a series of edits that you make to get from one to the other, and was scoring each edit on the so far built piece as basically a function that changes the entailment relation. And this is also a problem that he faced. And essentially the takeaway for him, I think, was that um, the unfortunate truth is that uh, the further you go, the, the longer your sentences get, the more likely you are to completely degenerate into something that you can't logically say is a particular relation. It's basically you kind of break down to I don't know. Um, so one thing that I've also left out here is the thinking that we are not limited to have to compute um, this kind of synchronous entailment parse over the full sentence. We can go as far as we can with some reliability threshold. And after that, say, okay, this is the best we could do. Now, how about we take, say, a dependency parse on this, this sentence that we're testing for entailment and just kind of use that to non-synchronously, just monolingually process the so far found relationships. Does that get us any further? Or simply we feed the spans that we could cover and the, their, their characteristics into a classifier. And that would be a, a rather dumb black box solution. So this is all stuff that we're thinking about and is not yet implemented or tested, obviously. But it's, uh, well, we're aware, I suppose. <laughs>